Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Stavros Yanuka. I'm the Executive Vice Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, it's my pleasure and indeed my honor to uh, welcome His Excellency Mr. Sim Kalas uh, to address us here. We are uh, privileged that uh, Mr. Kalas uh, has agreed to uh, come here this afternoon uh, and address us. Uh, he has had a very distinguished uh, career as uh, a uh, vice president of uh, the European Commission. Uh, he was vice president of uh, responsible for administration, audit, and anti-fraud from uh, 2004 uh, until uh, 2010. Uh, he was then uh, appointed again vice president uh, of uh, the European Commission, uh, this time with responsibility for transport. And that is the portfolio that uh, he occupies uh, today. Uh, before coming to, uh, before joining the European Commission, uh, Mr. Kalas uh, had a, a very distinguished uh, political career in his native uh, Estonia, where he served as Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and President of uh, the Central Bank. Uh, so, in many ways, uh, Mr. Kalas embodies. I think the kind of student that uh, we would like to produce at the Lee Kuan Yew School uh, of Public Policy, one who is uh, proficient both at the technical aspects of policy making uh, as well as uh, being a uh, successful uh, and effective uh, politician. Um, I should say that uh, um, for those of you who are not uh, perhaps familiar with, with uh, Estonian uh, history and, and development, that Mr. Kalas played a very significant part in restoring Estonian uh, statehood uh, shortly after the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union uh, and indeed the uh, prior collapse of the uh, Berlin Wall. Um, Mr. Kalas graduated uh, cum laude uh, from the Finance and Credit Department of the University of Tartu in uh, 1972 uh, and continued his studies as a postgraduate student until 1975. He is uh, uh, still a visiting professor at his alma mater and he confided in me uh, earlier that uh, once his term at the commission is up, he would like to um, return to uh, teaching, at which point I uh, immediately offered him a position here uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School. I think he's thinking about it. Um, in any event, uh, it is my pleasure again uh, to welcome you, uh, Vice President, uh, to take the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today is the third day of my visit as, as Commissioner, as Vice President of European Commission to Singapore and um, it has been full of, um, uh, of events and uh, meetings uh, uh, with, with a larger varying intensity. Uh, and I'm very happy that the last event during this visit is a possibility to talk in, in a university, to a university public, it's always an encouraging moment. Uh, and and um, I am very happy to, uh, to discuss with you whatever you want to discuss about the European affairs or European transport affairs in more narrow sense, <coughs> but, um, but all um, questions are, are <coughs> Warmly welcomed. I would like to set our, out our vision for European Union future transport policy. What else? This is my, my job today. In a globalized world, transport systems are changing rapidly as demand rises for goods and services. If countries are to meet that demand, efficient transport systems with modern infrastructure have to be in place first. 
They provide the means for people and businesses to get better access to the global trading system as well as we all get better connected. Globalization also means that with more European integration, including transport, there is a clear impact on the economies of Southeast Asian countries. These countries are very important to the European Union. In many areas, we are natural partners. So what does the future ho hold for Europe's transport policy in the next decades? In the European Union, as you know, we share a single market, single external border, and single trade policy. This really makes it easy to do business and has been fundamental for EU development in recent years. On transport, however, we have some serious challenges ahead, which I'm sure will also be familiar to you. <coughs> we must tackle our over-dependence on oil. Oil becomes more, more, most hot topics for, for all developments in transport. Transport still depends on 96% of, uh, of oil. So, uh, and especially in Europe, where the resources are limited, this is really a, a <coughs> nightmare, whatever, a, a priority which is overwhelmingly uh, most important. Of course, we have to develop reliable and clean alternative fuels. We have to meet ambitious targets on climate change by reducing transport, greenhouse gas emissions. And in Europe, we uh, have urgent need filling in the important missing network links. We have to replace today's patchwork of transport system, systems with a true European network where the different modes of transport are better linked, to, better linked together. We have to deal with bottlenecks and heavy administration and also with very serious technical incompatibilities inside the European transport area. As you can see, it is a long list. Firstly, we need to invest to expand and modernize transport infrastructure. Secondly, we must keep a strong emphasis on research and innovation as a way forward to sustainable growth, developing and developing alternative fuels. Thirdly, we need to focus on our overarching goal to build a single European transport area by 2050. When we have, when we have completed this unified area, the EU partners countries will gain from reduced and streamlined regulation. They will also gain from easier and improved market access to Europe's 500 million <coughs> consumers. As the EU moves to complete its single transport market, we can all gain from working together. By making the best use of European in Europe's investment, its specialized technical expertise, skill in innovation and transport manufacturing capabilities. You are experiencing strong demand for transport. <clears throat> to support the nation manufacturing boom and to move ever more volumes of cargo by area, air and sea. So let us build more region to region links. This would benefit all partner countries and especially Singapore. A safe, stable and secure transport gateway to Southeast Asia. Europe already enjoys many strong connections with this region. Transport is an example of where we can do more. As Europe's largest trading partner within ASEAN, Singapore is a good example how, of how such good connections can really work. In transport, many EU companies have been quick to recognize Singapore's economic and strategic importance for Southeast Asia often using it as a hub to service the wider Pacific Rim. And I am pleased that in turn, Europe has recognized the quality products made in Europe. Take the French Defense Electronics Group, Thales, selected in 2008 to provide Singapore with a new air traffic control system. 
and most recently Alstom awarded contracts to provide new trains and enhance Singapore's rail capacity. Once negotiations on an EU-Singapore free trade area are concluded, the EU will, able, will be able to move forward elsewhere in the region. This agreement will mark the start of a deeper European engagement with Asia. It can also serve as a basis for similar negotiations with other ASEAN countries. While ASEAN dynamically growing markets offer great potential, many of them are protected by high tariff and non-tariff barriers. We would naturally would prefer to see these removed. As a whole, the ASEAN countries are our third largest export market outside Europe, after the United States and China, with total bilateral trade of some 160 billion euro. The EU is also by far the largest investor in ASEAN countries. That sets out in economic terms why this region is so important for Europe. Let me now return to transport and to areas where I believe there is scope for more cooperation and trade. I'm thinking of aviation and the airspace industry, the maritime sector, research and development, in particular into cleaner fuels. To make cooperation work at its best, transport policies must be liberal and open-minded if bilateral or inter-regional trade is going to benefit. And like-mindedness yields results, it is important that both Europe and in Singapore see trade and investment as a key element in the global economic recovery. In aviation, I believe that we do think along similar policy lines. The EU has always been at the forefront of air services liberalization. Our aviation sector competes daily on a global scale. From 1992 to 2010, for example, the number of intra-EU routes with more than two carriers increased by 415%. This was after the liberalization of the European aviation market. Singapore's liberal policies have shown how a steady growth in traffic with EU countries can be successfully generated. They are also a major reason why Singapore has become the hub for Asian aviation today. It is clear that the continued expansion of the wider Asian aviation market will drive future growth in global air traffic in the decades ahead. So more bilateral cooperation in air traffic management would give a strong mutual benefit. We are also following ASEAN moves to build a single regional aviation market by 2015 with great interest. Let us also not forget international shipping for which Southeast Asia with Singapore at its heart is extremely important for the global maritime industry and global trade. Here Europe's presence is also already strong. Several European shipping companies now have Singapore registered ships and operate a great deal of their Asian business from here. Part of the discussions for the trade agreement I mentioned earlier include increasing access for European companies to Singapore's impressive market for international maritime transport services. For the European Union, the world's most important exporter and the second larger importer, shipping and related services are essential to help European companies compete globally. Shipping remains a vital industry for Europe. With more globalized trade links, seaborne transport is more important than ever for Europe's and world economy. The maritime sector accounts for the bulk of trading between Europe and Asia using some of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. But there are some serious threats to free, efficient and secure shipping. We need to work hard and together to overcome them. Volatile energy markets and climate change, piracy and other security concerns, increases in smuggling and counterfeit goods, just to name a few. Between 2005 and 2010, for example, our national customs authorities registered that counterfeit goods entering the EU has tripled. 
This is why we have engaged in an ambitious strategy to promote safe, secure, clean, and efficient shipping. The Blue Belt Project aims to reduce barriers to maritime movement by providing customs with reliable ship voyage date. But we need global action for this global industry to succeed. We are ready to do our part, and I sincerely hope that Singapore could join our efforts in the work being done at the International Maritime Organization. In shipbuilding, we are now more of specialized, as specialized niche manufacturers. As we look for new markets, that is also a strength. European expertise in top-end manufacturing can combine well with this regional shipbuilding industry. Our companies have a strong track record in innovation and specialized high-tech production. And we are investing a significant amount also of European money into research and development, particularly in clean energy innovation. This is where Europe's expertise in transport engineering could have a tremendous benefit for regional and global shipping. Cleaner combustion engines for ships, wider use of harbor treatment facilities to reduce ship exhaust gases, perhaps in locations like Singapore, more deployment of intelligent technologies like smart containers for securely integrated cargo flows across regions and different modes of, uh, of transport. These are all good examples of how EU companies can get more involved, especially given Singapore's superior port facilities and prime location. To conclude, our two regions can only benefit from improving and expanding transport ties, and not only in the areas I have mentioned. Many of the problems that we face are indeed global problems. Let us help each other to tackle them in the best and most efficient way possible. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Callas. Uh, we're now uh, opening the uh, floor to, uh, to questions. And uh, as is uh, the practice, uh, can I invite you, please, to uh, come up to the microphones, uh, introduce yourselves uh, briefly, say which organization uh, uh, you are from, and uh, pose a brief, uh, sharp uh, question. Uh, just come up to the microphone, please. Thank you, uh, Commissioner and Vice President. My name is Alan Tan. I'm a professor of aviation law here at the Law School of the National University of Singapore. I couldn't agree with you more that transport is the key, particularly air transport in my view, to stronger links between Singapore, uh, between the European Union and Southeast Asia. My question has got to do with the potential, the prospect of an open aviation area between the EU and this region. And you might like to start with uh, Singapore. What's holding you back? I understand that the EU and particularly European airlines are very hesitant to get into an open skies deal which will allow all Singapore carriers to fly from any point in Singapore to any point in the EU and all European carriers to fly from any point in the EU to any point in Singapore. Now you might say that uh, <laughs> this is an unequal deal because we have only one point to offer but uh, I would submit that that's an old school protectionist mentality and the Americans and the Chinese have gone beyond that to offer us an open skies deal. And uh, if you like to think about it, as I tell my students, it's an encirclement strategy. I would submit that you start with us and then slowly you can persuade the other bigger markets in the region to, uh, to offer you the same deal. So could I have your comments please on, on what's the real reason behind the reluctance mm -hmm. to get into this deal with us? You know, uh we discussed this issue uh, during my visit with Minister of Transport and, and uh, with other representatives of, of um, Singapore. Uh, and this open sky agreement will come sooner or later. It is, um, it is in, in, uh, we, in Europe, um, there are two layers for this kind of decision making. Uh, we, at, at the European Union level, 
uh, we are very much in favor of liberalizing markets, opening the markets, and, and uh, pushing for open sky agreements. We need a mandate from member states. And this is much more complicated. It, it becomes much more complicated. It is improving, but you, we have now had the experience of, of negotiating uh, open sky agreements with Brazil, uh, with Georgia, uh, we're still on several ongoing negotiations. Uh, and the um, United States, of course, as well. Uh, and, um, and so at the European level, uh, if we will have a mandate from member states, but the problem is that always is one member state or some member states who have some particular interest uh, and particular very short-sighted view that, you know, this is something, some, this particular case is harming, harming uh, uh, their interest. And, um, but it, it is improving because, uh, because understanding that aviation is really a global one. It's, it's, uh, it's becoming more and more clear and we, we will face global airlines, we will face, uh, we will face uh, questions of global fair competition, not only regional, not only inside the regions, but we, we also uh, must really discuss, discuss how to ensure level playing field, which is very much in, in, in European talks very important. Sometimes it covers other interests, but sometimes it's, it's real. Uh, to, to really to, to have a fair competition, fair, uh, fair um, uh, a level playing field uh, uh, at, at the global, global level. Uh, this is coming and uh, I simply think that we, 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 from our side, the European Commission side, we, we are in favor of, uh, of um, having this and developing this open sky agreement. But, uh, and we also have said to member states many times that if you think that bilateral agreements are more successful, it can be a great illusion. And, and we can negotiate at European level to, to especially, uh, not, not you will have a better, better agreements with countries X, but at European level we can have a really comprehensive air service agreements, which, which also, which then really ensures transparent and, and fair uh, business environment. So, so that's, that's my answer. Uh, so far, it has not been uh, uh, given the mandate to negotiate with, with Singapore and several other countries, but we will go again and ask this again, and then, then it comes quite soon. I think that it, 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 it will come. It's, it's very clear that, that Singapore is, is a very good, good has a very good potential to have this uh, open sky agreement. <clears throat> Perhaps I can, uh, I can ask a question. Um, in many ways, transport has been very successful uh, part of inter-European uh, policy as, as your uh, speech outlined, Commissioner. But in, in some other areas, though, it, it has been less successful. For example, just to follow on, uh, the uh, air, airline industry example, we still in Europe have um, national airline companies that are, um, shall we say, not viable as uh, independent enterprises. The dream of, of a single European integrated market was that these airlines would either change or be allowed to uh, uh, go insolvent. What, what has gone wrong there? Why has... Uh, the single market not completed no. itself. No, basically, I, I, I slightly disagree with you. It's, um, uh, it, it has worked, and we don't have national carriers. So we don't have national airlines. All airlines are European airlines and, and uh, are recognized outside also as European carriers. Uh, finally, we, we managed to uh, also to, to have an uh, political agreement with Russia, but also they, they recognize this fact. So this is, this is a formal part of, of all this, uh, uh, this issue. Uh, you are right that there are still very many airlines uh, which are linked to the government as a, some kind of um, past, um, the historical, with the historical past. They still, of course, we all consider in Estonia and in Greece and something as a national carrier. Now, if these carriers 
will not commercially survive, then we'll say will not survive. Government and cannot give to these companies state aid. And state aid is just uh, uh, something, taxpayers' money, uh, which, which then um, uh, and guarantees or gives a possibility to operate operationally. And the European Commission <coughs> is a very fierce and, <coughs> and very strict in these rules. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, <coughs> and it is very strict. And uh, state aid is, is, will, 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 will be stopped. What, what is legal when government, for instance, nationalizes or buys this airline and, and puts money to, um, to this as, as equity as, and operating as an as a, as a enterprise in, in a totally transparent and fair business environment? I, I, this is also has a very limited possibilities. I think that we, will, we had a big wave of consolidation of companies in Europe, and we, this will continue. We'll, we will obviously, you already see uh, there are troubles with uh, Hungarian um, uh, airline, Spanair uh, went to, into bankruptcy, uh, and this is, so, so formally the environment to European airlines exists. The historical past, some, uh, some uh, dreams to keep obsolete businesses ongoing uh, still uh, exist uh, and but no, you know you cannot also say to the governments that uh, okay you you should not try but they try if they try to 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 keep or to give a chance then it's only once you, you inject capital you will be part of this and you possibly risk also losing this capital <coughs> please Um, thank you. Um, I'm Michael Ewing Chow. I'm from the Faculty of Law Singapore. I'm the WTO Chair for Singapore. And permit me if I to ask a question about the current uh, carbon taxes for aviation. Uh, I'm curious about it because uh, I want to know how the thinking process for implementing this came about. Uh, the reason why I ask is that there is a carbon tax uh, for aviation, but much limited uh, procedures or limited regulations for transport by train and transport by cars. Um, this was then uh, imposed, some say unilaterally by Europe, though there was a fair amount of warning. But understanding that there is a difference between the uh, regime for the transport for aviation and a difference between the regime for the transportation over land by trains and by cars. What was the thinking that went on behind this? And what was the thinking uh, behind the sort of unilateral, though with fair warning, imposition of the new regime? Thank you. Of course, I, <clears throat> I had a great opportunity during these um, two days to um, uh, answer the same question. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I tried to be, uh, not to be too long. Uh, this was a decision of last commission uh, when, when uh, it, uh, to, to go to aviation, this was based on, on the discussions in International Civil Aviation Organization already 2004. There was a discussion and where International Civil Aviation Organization uh, expressed positive attitude towards so-called market-based measures. And this is, in this sense, it's not a tax. It's not um, uh, totally correct to use it as a tax because somebody pays, somebody gain. It is not collected for, for budget. It's, it's, it's in this sense, it's not tax. Uh, and uh, so system formally has started to function from 1st of January 2012. Why aviation? Uh, Aviation was one of the most, uh, the, the growth in aviation was, uh, was the fastest in, in, uh, in transport modes and transport in general. If, uh, when, when other sectors of economy reduced their carbon dioxide emission, transport goes, still goes up. <coughs> and aviation is 
very spectacular and very symbolic part of this. So um, I cannot say why it was immediately taken in, in, in transport, but we, of course, consider a, con taken in aviation, but we consider it as a, uh, uh, one step, and we definitely have, have also ideas how to, how to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in other modes of transport. That's another big story. Uh, but, but the current situation is, is um, uh, here, particularly here in this region during the yesterday's this, uh, or uh, Tuesday's conference, Monday's conference, um, it is, it's, it's particularly highlighted because there is a serious political conflict in the world. This European emission trading scheme was opposed, was politically opposed, is politically opposed by the United States. Uh, then China has made a declaration uh, uh, criticizing this system. And so there is a serious political problem. I recognize it, I fully admit it is a serious political problem. And it is, it, we have tried from, from my own side to, to find necessary wordings and solutions, but so far it not, has not worked. Um, and and uh, now there is a question uh, how, to, how to, to solve this political conflict. And there is, a, uh, of course, uh, everybody, I think, also at, at the top level of uh, political decision makers have realized that there is no, no need or it's bad consequence to have a trade war or something like that, uh, some measures, countermeasures, tensions, declarations, uh, uh, and business uncertainty as a consequence. Uh, that's it. Uh, but, but you also must, must, um, uh, must know one thing, that in Europe, where, we, where I am operating, first of all, airlines all have complied. We have not a single international operating airline who has not submitted data, who has not complied with this system with the first stage, was last year. Second, this is, we, have, we don't have any single European government which questions the European emission trading scheme uh, as a whole. So our political environment is that Europe is committed to, to, to implement this, uh, this system. And, um, uh, and also, the system itself is not a bad one. We, we, uh, and we, we have exchanged, um, uh, we have uh, changed letters with United States uh, leaders uh, about this issue where we clearly have said that we are ready to revisit our system when or and if there will be a global solution. Now, everybody is, is very intensively working towards a looking for a global solution. Uh, it is within the International Civil Aviation Organization, and, and this, is, uh, this can be the way out. Now, uh, now the question is, of course, as they will always in, in details about the concrete, concrete provisions, uh, but we, we are ready to, if there is, a, there is a promising and ambitious global solution with two elements. One, um, targets, clear targets to reduce emissions, not only declarations, that's very good, uh, but also targets and the ways how to, how to implement these targets. And uh, I, I think that um, uh, this is a way out. We work, work with this and we work also with other modes of transport. But of course, it's just simply some remarks concerning other modes of transport. Uh, in car transport, in, in which is the biggest, biggest CO2 emitter, and we think how to reduce it, but it has come tremendously down due to the technological innovation, engines, uh, combustion engines use, so, so big decline has been in the relative consumption of fuel. And various these issues are working in the same direction in uh, big um, uh, trucks, uh, so-called Euro, Euro, Euro 4, Euro 5, Euro 6 uh, standards have tremendously, substantially reduced uh, the use of, uh, of oil, which means also reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Uh, but it is uh, probably, you, you touched, uh, sorry if I was too long, but uh, you touched one of the most hot issues uh, for us today in today's global transport policy and, and from transport party side. 
uh, we are, of course, committed and interested uh, to facilitate, uh, to, to find as soon as possible a way out that this will not create a big confrontation. Okay, we have a question in the back, and then Johannes. Um, good afternoon, I'm Moritz Heile, master's student um, at the Faculty of Law. Um, Mr. Vice President, um, a couple of days ago it was reported that the uh, government in Beijing, the Chinese government, has um, told um, its airlines not to, uh, to participate in the um, emission trading scheme. So seriously, what are you going to do if Chinese airlines say, no, we're not going to participate? They have not said, said yet no. And we don't have anything on paper. Yesterday we had a summit uh, in Beijing, uh, EU-China summit, with the participation from our side, President, President Barroso. And this issue, as much as I know, was touched, but, uh, but, uh, but so far we don't have any concrete, <coughs> concrete um, uh, fact or concrete description what will happen and how this will be, how they will enforce their decision. Uh, and then we will see, of course, because uh, China has also committed to, uh, to um, um, follow the legal environment and legal, legal legality of decisions. So far, em emission trading scheme has not to have no pending legal case against system, uh, this system. It was a case, but it was Court of Justice, European Court of Justice decided that this is compatible with international law. So um, the answer is um, uh, until we, we, we know what is, exactly, uh, what is exactly the action, then we will, will, will see what, what to do. My name is Johannes Loh. I work for the Asian Trends Monitoring Bulletin here at the school as a research associate. And my question is about the transport sector cars, which you mentioned and highlighted as key. So my question is, um, do you think Europe is doing enough to push R&D in electric vehicles? And what is the possible scenario of Asia uh, outperforming Europe as they are doing in solar energy? If not soon enough, uh, Europe is pushing this sector further. Thank you. About solar energy, probably it's not a question. Um, I am not the most competent person to, uh, to, to reply. It's, uh, it's in, in energy uh, field. Uh, about transport and electric transport, uh, we have had during these days also a various discussion. We are, what, we are, what are we doing first? We have um, uh, budget discussion, ongoing budget discussions uh, about the next seven years, multi-annual financial framework, 2014-2020. There is a um, commission proposal, includes substantial increase of uh, money for research and development, and we have agreed with research uh, commissioner uh, that there will be also a substantial amount of money for transport research. What is transport research? So there will be money, we will finance, I think that there will be quite a substantial amount of money. So, so we, 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 we have uh, uh, certain resources. We also um, have some other uh, projects concerning the, uh, uh, connecting Europe facility and to, to promote um, some networks. But exactly the main question is, in this research and development, what exactly to do? Europe also is, is we, we even promote, uh, uh, we have a pro, uh, project called, called Emotion, where we put some 24 million euro to, to this project uh, to develop electric cars and electric uh, cars. But electric cars have three problems. One, they don't reduce congestion. We still have. This is a, if, if I, I probably didn't highlight, I, I later thought in my, my remarks uh, that if, if people in Europe are asked what is the main, three main problems of European transport, they, they answer first congestion, second congestion, third congestion. And this is, this is nightmare. And this will only become worse and worse, and not only on roads, but also in, 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 uh, in air. 
uh, and um, so we and we look from this viewpoint electric cars a private electric car uh, is um, uh, doesn't reduce congestion. Second problem is that, uh, that the electric car is a uh, quite expensive one. And third problem is that batteries are still, yeah, basically, the, the solution has not been found. Yes, batteries have been tremendously improved. But, uh, but, uh, from, but electric car, first electric car was constructed somewhere in, uh, not very many years later, than the, the, the combustion cars. So it was beginning of 19th century. Already, first models of electric cars were, were developed. Uh, but where we see the potential, anyway, transport research, uh, we think must be focused on the word, on item of fuel. So to reduce the consumption of fuel, to reduce the consumption of, of uh, the use of uh, fossil fuel, uh, to create, to develop cleaner fuels, cleaner engines, and this direction uh, is going. What is, uh, what is the danger with all our research projects is that we try not to have uh, how to say, supply driven research program. But we have money and then we look around where is now the project and if there's something appears which, like, is, which looks like a project, it will be financed. At the same time, to focus more on, uh, on some very serious, uh, serious and, and, uh, and substantial projects, and then we, we simply have distributed money uh, uh, between small, small ones. This is a big, big program for, for not only Europe, I think that all governmental research and development programs everywhere. I don't think so that Singapore is some kind of exception, at least in my own country, there was also the question how to find right projects, where to focus money. And, but in electric cars and, and uh, uh, electric transport, we see quite a huge potential in public transport. Because bus, electric bus, for instance, is of course much more, um, can be much more uh, energy efficient than a private car. And how, but then we have to create, a, build a network for, for these buses. But uh, this is also promising, promising development. Uh, for this. Uh, so um, we support the development of electric cars, but this is my view. Of course, we have great enthusiasts of electric cars in Europe and uh, our companies are developing. But my view is a structural problem. If we only replace combustion cars with electric cars, we don't solve the congestion problem. Uh, Commissioner, if I may, Go back to the question again of uh, the carbon taxes. I know it's a hot issue. I know you must be tired of uh, hearing from it, but uh, allow me to sort of uh, raise the issue on trading goods and how this relates to trading goods. I'm totally aware that you probably have been briefed on this, but here is a concern that comes from the trade community. Uh, let's take the case of flowers from Kenya. Flowers in Kenya can only be sent to European Union through air. Any other means, it will perish before it gets there. Meanwhile, they compete directly with flowers from Holland, which are spread around Europe. Flowers are only just one aspect of the investment trade. Flowers from Holland to the rest of Europe can come by cars, can come by trains, which are not then taxed. Flowers from Kenya come by air and are taxed. I understand it's not taxed in the way that you think it is, but it creates a disproportionate effect. You have a measure which is correct, aimed at dealing with the environment, but on the trade and goods issue, creates a disproportionate effect. This could also be true for uh, high-end electronic goods, which are sent by air, or by pharmaceuticals, which are sent by air. Uh, so these are some of the concerns that the trade community, looking at it, sees. And I wonder what the response would be for this. There can be two parts of, of response. One is, is uh, that we have large variety of calculations. What is the economic impact of our emission trading scheme? And, and even in the most maximum, uh, maximum assessments of the, of the size of the possible contribution, what is the economic consequence for companies who don't, uh, don't have enough uh, 
good planes, because who, who have a good plane, they, they are gaining from this system. It uh, doesn't look um, tremendously big, the amount of, of money, and it doesn't look uh, as, as a factor um, uh, which, which has a serious impact on the competition. But about uh, taxing, uh, if, you take, uh, if you take this in an isolated way, but you should, should know also that uh, many countries in the world have, are taxing the landing, uh, landing of, of airplanes just for, for fiscal reasons. It's also in Europe, but it is not even majority of European countries. It's only, I don't know exactly, but it was eight, but I think so it's not now already more. And again, in the United States, the same. So, so you anyway have certain national fiscal regimes which are different. Concerning the cars, it is the same. We have in Europe 24 countries uh, who tax road transport in a way or another having fees, uh, tolling fees, uh, or having so-called vignette uh, payments. So they, they all have some, some influence, uh, some impact on, on the competition, but that's, um, that's uh, an unfortunate side of life that uh, uh, death and taxes are unavoidable. <laughs> And if, um, if we have, uh, okay, one more question. Um, can I ask you uh, your comments about uh, the very public quarrel between the United Arab Emirates and the government of Canada in recent months, and ostensibly it has nothing to do with Europe, uh, over the uh, restricted landing rights of UAE carriers in Canada. Um, if you ask someone in the aviation industry, they'll tell you that if you dig beneath the surface, uh, the suspicion is that it has got to do with a certain European carrier uh, which uh, Air Canada coach shares with and sends a lot of their passengers through its hub on the way to India. Um, so my, my, my question is that if, uh, and, and this same carrier has also been resisting efforts by Emirates, for instance, to get more landing rights in Berlin and in, in Dusseldorf and many other cities in that country. So my, my, my question is, um, is this consistent with the free <coughs> trade and open skies and open competition policy that uh, the major European airlines profess to champion? Um, I don't know anything about the conflict between you know, United Arab Emirates and Canada. I, I, frankly, I don't, see, I don't know about it. I only know that, uh, that the landing rights are still very much the national, in national, uh, hands of national uh, uh, administrations. Uh, and um, you don't know all the currents uh, in, 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 in administrative decision making. It, can be so and so. Um, in general, if Europe uh, discovers that uh, this, this kind of activities are used to, to harm competition and it can be really proved by evidence, then it can be a court case. Uh, but uh, landing rights, we, we, there are also various aspects in these landing rights. We have airports <coughs> which simply are, are so busy. Um, Heathrow uh, take off and landing capacity is used 99%. 99. The busiest airport probably in the world in this sense. Uh, in terms of capacity, capacity is up to the limit. Finished. The other big European airports have also uh, very, very busy schedules. Some other airports have, have uh, enough space for landing and, and take off and, uh, and this is this is even decided administratively by a certain body, which, uh, <coughs> which has nothing to do with market economy and is distributing these landing, landing rights. And the concerning the Emirates, uh, concerning the Gulf carriers, they have access to some European countries' airports, and uh, they are developing their business model. I, don't, I cannot say that uh, there is a, some kind of very special case uh, <coughs> where we... Uh, <coughs> It was special policy in favor or against uh, some out, outside uh, carrier. So, so it, uh, definitely there is a fierce competition. We know that Gulf carriers are serious competitors all over the world. It definitely makes uh, other, uh, other um, um, players nervous. 
but um, so far it, uh, it in, in, in European um, space uh, it, it, it's in all in legal legal limits I, I don't I have not heard any any very special politics or policies against against compet outside competition perhaps I can ask a, a last question but I'll uh, defer to the lady in red Hi, good evening. My name is Rachel from the British High Commission. Um, I'm really interested to hear your views on what you think Singapore is able to do as a player in terms of fostering a stronger partnership between Europe and Southeast Asia in terms of transportation. Thank you. We discussed these matters seriously with Minister. Um, you know, what is Maybe it's my personal view, but, but I am coming from a, a society uh, which was quite different from, from society we live today. And what is the main change in, in, let's say so, if you take Estonia, and I am always asked, I'm always, my soul is, econo I am economist, my soul is in economy. So everybody thinks that if, if I am asked that, okay, what, 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 what is a major change of paradigm? And, uh, and uh, it's expected that I say something about economy, but it's not economy, it's legal environment, which is uh, key. And I think, uh, so my, my opinion is not my only, but official op opinion of European Union is that, that Singapore is very advanced in, in having a fair legal environment for business. This is not so widespread in the world. And if you want to develop Develop, uh, no, for instance, I, I had very big uh, negotiations with Russian counterparts and uh, they have made a political decision to take over the European safety regulation. A aviation safety, you know, it's extremely important and sensitive issue. But this is not the question of, uh, of luggage or, or, or baggage, baggage door closing or not closing. This is a question of inspection. How this is inspected? Are the inspectors independent? Or can they take phone calls from somebody who says that, come on, don't write it down, don't, don't do it. I must fly, we must, you know, our, our, our country's interest is that this plane will take off. Uh, and that's, that's a system where we, and, and we, of course, safety is utmost, uh, 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 utmost um, importance for, uh, uh, for Europe and especially, no, you know all what what is what is uh, sensitivity of of especially airlines. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, we can trust Singapore very much, uh, being as a very important hub for for airlines. That we know that planes which take off here are safe, and uh, it it was very simple, a simple saying. The second issue is what what uh, where we again from my viewpoint, see uh, where is room for improvement and, um, and uh, also room, not improvement even, but room for bigger, uh, larger cooperation is, is definitely maritime transport, piracy, and also fair transport rules. And, and uh, I mentioned the counterfeit issues. Um, I, in last commission, I was responsible for fight against fraud. And we had uh, three big, very big international actions against counterfeiting and smuggling all over the world, where the maritime transport plays an extremely important role. So maritime uh, if containers are transported by ships in, in, um, in the last, in the more vast majority. Uh, here again, we, we can, uh, can, uh, can find ways and can, can uh, develop this um, this cooperation, again, based on very good work of law enforcement agencies and, and very good legal environment. Um, so, um, and of course, uh, the, just geographically, historically, the location of Singapore is so important uh, that it can be, can be also a very important uh, country for European Union to develop the ASEAN, ASEAN region and region, relations with ASEAN region as well. This was also uh, was a matter of, uh, of uh, talks between 
between Minister and myself and between Deputy Prime Minister who also discussed this issue. So um, uh, I, I, I see here really um, good, good potential. Let me uh, ask the final question, if I may, and, and uh, move us away from, uh, from transport uh, onto a broader uh, European issue, which is the, the ongoing uh, financial crisis. Now, you guided, uh, as, as a politician, as a central banker, your uh, native country through a uh, hopeful but nevertheless difficult uh, period in its, uh, in its history. Uh, what advice, what insights can you offer us uh, in terms of the kind of difficulty that Europe is facing today uh, and how, uh, if uh, possible, can Europe uh, manage and emerge stronger uh, out of this uh, situation? Yeah, that's... Um, uh, first of all, I, I cannot tell you something surprising what you already don't know from all information channels. Uh, it's a very difficult, difficult issue. Uh, but you mentioned uh, my own past. We somehow managed in Estonia to create the faith that balanced budget is a very good thing and government should not borrow. When, when government even, and, and the Estonian government doesn't have bonds, government and bonds, we don't borrow at all. So we have reserves. Uh, what are sometimes used. Then it also statistically can create a small deficit of budget. But it is so heavily criticized in, in Parliament. That's, that has become uh, some kind of national value, that the budget should be balanced. And what can be more rational? <laughs> it's, it's a main advice. So, so in this sense, uh, um, I very much share the view that, uh, okay, that, uh, that uh, budget... Uh, you cannot develop your economy based on, on uh, uh, okay, you, you all, business can be, can, must, must take uh, credit, must, must use credits and use borrowed money, but it must be always clear how it will be paid back. And sometimes, definitely, Europe and some countries have, uh, have um, borrowed too much uh, without very clear understanding how to pay it back, and this is now the crisis. Um, what, what uh, its most difficult question is nobody, it's, if I read uh, the newspapers, uh, uh, especially English language newspapers, then it's uh, the, the, what's the eminent collapse is, is every day you can read that everything collapses. Uh, I don't think so, that this collapse is really imminent. Uh, because, or, or even coming, that because nobody's interested in this collapse. Nobody's interested. And there cannot be other, other way out than, than certain uh, <laughs> measures to, to start to pay the debt back, that borrowed money back. But it's, of course, difficult if you really put all numbers together and the country X, you, you see that there is no way that you, 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 you cannot see where is, uh, where is the revenue stream. Where you can, but uh, in Estonia, Estonian government during, uh, definitely it's not me who must talk about the Estonian government, but uh, we had also, a government had difficult times in 2008 and 2009, uh, where everywhere the financial crisis hit hard. But then it was Estonian society in, in a way of, um, un, uh, how to say, undeclared consensus. So this was a silent consensus accepted to cut also the salaries and to, to, to and, and not go to demonstrations. Salaries were cut. Now they have returned to the same level. Jobs were saved and budget is again balanced. <laughs> but, uh, but this is, of course, an uh, issue which probably, um, you know, one, <coughs> one important um, sentence to understand the thinking of economists is, uh, it's not my, my creation, it's I quote somebody, but I don't know whom, uh, said that, you know, these economists are very clever people. They always can clearly, clearly tell you uh, what will happen. And then always they can tell you afterwards why it didn't happen so. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, I would be very happy to anal analyze this crisis afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Vice President, uh, for uh, uh, a very enjoyable uh, dialogue. Uh, please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking uh, Vice President Kalas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you once Thank more. You. Thank you.